The leopard caught the young impala easily. There was nothing its mother could do. That's the natural order of things. It's just an ordinary day, or almost. So you might think that perhaps when tonight is over, in the savannah too, Christmas will be a celebration. The 24th has started cheerfully, but really it's like this every day. At sunrise in the savannah, all is lively and relaxed from January to December. But in December, while elsewhere they're decorating the Christmas trees, here they have to make do with acacias instead of fir trees. But nature has spread around the savannah many little clues that suggest that here too, it's a holiday. Hanging from parasitic creepers tangled up in the foliage, these fruits are reminiscent of tree decorations. Everywhere you can see garlands hanging from branches. These are the flowers of a mimosa, the mimosa cinerea. They flower at precisely this time of year. And they make such a good display that the shrub is sometimes called the Kalahari Christmas tree. But there's one thing more needed to complete the picture and create the illusion. It only lasts a few days and it's precisely at this holiday time of the year. Here and there, as you approach the area where the terrapin lives, you can see a few patches of what surprisingly look like snow. If you look carefully at the more or less immaculate substance that is attached to the trunks, the grasses and the branches, you'll notice that in every case it is above some watering place. We owe these unusual patches to an animal which, like the python, can disappear into the background, and which is also a cold-blooded animal. This is the grey tree frog. In normal times, it merges into the branches. In the period of reproduction, it shows itself spectacularly. Thanks to these adhesive discs, the tree frog hangs on very tightly in a vertical position during the act of mating. For here it is in fact mating. The males, always smaller than the female, hang onto her back, often several at a time, and beat their secretions like humans whipping up egg white. The more they beat, the more the foam rises. It will harden in contact with the air and the female will lay her eggs in it. The tadpoles will be born inside this foam nest. 
and then fall into the water below to continue their transformation. This will take several weeks. This means that they will not become frogs in time for Christmas. Indeed, in the savannah, they've all had their present already. It's the same for all of them every year, and yet every year the animals welcome it with the same joy. This is it. Lots and lots of green grass. The grown-ups love it as much as the young. For the red-billed buffalo weaver, this tall grass is not the present itself. It's like wrapping paper. What matters is what's inside it. Of course, the herbivores are the most spoilt. This grass is fresh and tender and so nourishing, so easy to collect, they'll have to spend much less time grazing. It's a treat for everyone and a godsend for the females who are thinking about motherhood. For the impalas, it's quite simple. The period for giving birth coincides exactly with the appearance of the green grass. And if the vegetation is late in coming, the females slow down their gestation. When Christmas comes in the savannah, you see huge numbers of little gazelles. They're barely one, two or three weeks old and are more often together than with their mothers. The mother impalas usually have only one baby and quite honestly don't take much interest in it. And so while they go and graze somewhere else, the babies gather together somewhere in the middle of the herd, under the watchful eye of one or two females on guard duty. These gatherings of babies have a name. Scientists talk of a creche. So that's what a creche looks like in the savannah. On this 24th of December at 11 o'clock, the air temperature is already 30 degrees. Most of the animals are looking for somewhere cool. They cut down their activity to a minimum, but do what is essential. Which, for this male, means keeping a permanent watch on the females and bringing the ones who wander off a bit too far back to the center of his harem. The demonstration is effective for all those who might be tempted by a little adventure. It's estimated that less than 2% of females each year leave their clan for another. At noon, while the African hoopoe has found some cool shade to groom itself, a group of elephants is moving around in full sunlight. This is because they know where there's a watering hole and they're going there to cool off. Only the chameleon at this moment is keeping very busy. As his metabolism increases with the ambient temperature, it's just the moment for him to go hunting. However, it's quite the opposite for the wild dogs.
The whole pack settles down in the shade and enjoys a very welcome rest. Their bellies are full, probably of impala meat. Here, for these carnivores, that is practically the only source of food. The pack has a very clear hierarchy, and yet there is no noticeable tension between the members. And when a latecomer wants to find its place in the shade in the middle of all the others, there's no visible sign of annoyance or irritation for the disturbance. During the siesta, or when hunting, the dogs are inseparable. They are highly efficient predators, having extraordinary hearing and sense of smell. Wild dogs easily detect any potential game by its odour. But the dogs themselves give off such a very strong smell that other animals know when they're nearby or recently have been. This encourages prey to get away and parasites to settle. A few inches from here we can observe a predation between mini carnivores. Ants attacking a centipede. This time, the poisonous hooks that the centipede generally uses to kill its victims are of no use to it. Here is another species of ant and the same demonstration. By attacking as a group, you can get the better of an enemy bigger than yourself. Each ant injects a small dose of venom into this dung beetle. Its attempts to shake off its attackers are of no avail. It will be poisoned rapidly. On this Christmas Eve, we hope there is better news for all the herbivores, and especially for these female water bucks. Their coats, longest of any gazelles, is perfect for this holiday period, but in the other hemisphere. It was long thought that the waterbuck's long hair served to protect them from predators. They are covered with an oily layer smelling strongly of musk, and that would spoil the taste of the meat. In reality, lions regularly partake from among their ranks. Not because of this mark, which shows up as a target, but because they know where to find them. Waterbucks travel less than a kilometer a day and have to drink regularly. The cheetah shouldn't present any danger for these antelopes. The elephants have found their watering hole. That is, without doubt, one of the best presents that an elephant can dream of. To cool off by immersing itself completely and using its trunk as a snorkel.
If one of his friends joins in these water sports, the pleasure is complete. Between these two males of pretty well the same size, the hierarchy hasn't been clearly established. Bath time is the opportunity to give a few demonstrations of strength and show a spirit of competition. The elephants themselves probably can't tell the difference between what is play and what isn't in these fairly harmless confrontations. Ideally, and it is the case here during the Christmas period when the pools are full, elephants take a daily bath. They always bathe after quenching their thirst and generally end up squirting mud, which, as it dries, forms a protective layer on the skin. It's an essential moment in the elephant's daily program. A program with no surprises for those to whom nothing untoward can happen. This delightful day will be spent eating. They will stuff themselves with grass, even if the silica it contains prematurely wears out their teeth. The water bucks are not so serene. Their group has had to break up in a hurry. And as always, in an emergency, they've all gone towards the watering hole. But a young female is missing. There she is. The cheetah is enjoying a feast. Whenever it can, the cheetah drags its prey under cover. This shade will do because the carcass will be less noticeable. The big cat meets up with his brothers and all becomes clear. A cheetah that weighs about 50 kilos could never overcome a water bug that weighs at least twice as much. But there were four of them, four young males, all brothers. Coalitions of young males are common. They comprise two or sometimes three individuals. It's very rare for four cheetahs to get together. The interest of coalitions is not obvious. Of course, it means they can catch larger prey, but then they have to share it. And there's always a great risk that they'll get it stolen. If they have a lookout, they can avoid a confrontation. But that won't change anything. If a lion, a leopard or a hyena comes near, they'll have to abandon their prize. Vultures arriving isn't a problem as such. As there are four of them, the cheetahs can keep them away. But the birds have doubtless been spotted by other predators that are already homing in on the carcass. So they eat a lot. 
They eat quickly. Another few mouthfuls. The cheetahs have been spoiled. They've had their Christmas dinner a bit early. From then, the afternoon of the 24th was quite ordinary. The animals often stayed in the shade. Some of them ate. But overall, there was a distinct lack of excitement in the savannah. As usual, Christmas Eve or not, they wait until two hours before the sun goes down before they get active again. The baby impalas are trying out their mobility for the first time. The little gazelles can stand for barely 10 minutes after they're born. As soon as they're two days old, they have to be able to follow the group. This impressive clan of about 100 beasts is largely dominated by the females and their young. But a few young unattached males live alongside them. They are easily recognized because with impalas only the males have horns. And they use them. These young males who are confronting each other all the time, sometimes seriously, sometimes not, are already capable of reproducing. But they have to wait until they're four years old before it's their turn to take over a harem. The females are permanently subjected to the paranoia of the dominant male. They're obliged to mate from the age of 18 months. They carry their young for about 200 days. At the end of this long gestation, all these vigorous and well-behaved babies are here for Christmas. One thing is striking about impalas, whatever their age. It's the condition of their coats. Nearly always perfectly clean, perfectly smooth, it is both a sign of good health and the guarantee of good condition in general. This is the result of several particular things. Not only is the impala the smallest mammal to welcome the assistance of the oxpeckers, but even the youngest of them accept this invaluable help. They sometimes get a bit much, but are very useful in getting rid of ticks. For the rest of the hygiene arrangements, a visit to the monkeys is called for. Or in this particular case, the baboons. The baboons and the impalas often find themselves together at the same place. Without saying exactly that they seek each other out, the fact that they frequent each other stems less from chance than from complicity. There are few absolute explanations for this neighborliness. Perhaps it might be that in this environment where the leopard is the predator of both of them, they can warn each other. Unless it's all about common interests to do with food.
In any case, both species have had plenty of chances to observe one another. And as this is a special evening, why not imagine a Christmas tale on the subject? The monkeys knew they were very agile, but also they found themselves very ugly, and even, to be quite frank, a bit vulgar. They envied the impala's elegance and natural grace, but they knew they could never compete with them on that point. So, they decided to try to rival them in another area, the cleanliness of the coat. And there, the monkeys had an advantage over the antelopes, hands. They could use them to remove with great precision the smallest creature, the slightest bit of dead skin from their fellow creature. As the impalas were afraid of losing the title of most beautiful coat, they too started to groom each other. In fact, the impala is the only mammal to practice mutual de-lousing. This ritual can be observed in animals of both sexes, and even with single males. It's the only time they allow one of their fellow creatures to come closer than two meters. The young also practice this habit. From their very earliest days, the baby impalas look after the coats of their little friends. before sunset, just before Christmas night begins, the families have all got together and the processions begin. But there are families and families, those that are united and supportive like the elephants, where everyone looks out for the smallest in the group, and others like the impalas, gazelles that are quite indifferent to each other and only travel together out of a gregarious instinct. As night approaches when the hyenas leave their young to go off hunting, the impalas must be doubly alert, especially as the vegetation is dense and lends itself to an ambush. This is the time when an attack can also come from a leopard or a lion. But clearly, they have something different on their minds. Over the next few hours, the lions will mate every 20 minutes. Not because it's Christmas, simply to try to reproduce. Mm. For every lion cub that reaches adulthood, it is estimated that there are 3,000 acts of mating.
Christmas Day has begun in the rain. And it's not surprising. In southern Africa, Christmas marks the beginning of summer. The days are hot, and the air is saturated with humidity. In fact, there's nothing really to upset the spirit or the activities of anyone. When the rain had stopped as abruptly as it had started, mushrooms had appeared on some droppings saturated with water. who always stop grazing when it rains, have resumed their feeding phase. A leopard is watching them from a distance. For the moment, no one can tell whether he will respect the Christmas truce. So much rain has fallen during the night that in some places the water courses have broken their backs. The flooded savannah offers some fine opportunities to all who wish to improve their daily life on this holiday. This woolly-necked stork would like to find a frog to tuck into. As for the marabou, he's already found a large one. At Christmas time, frogs are not really in a party mood. Predators are coming from everywhere. And even the hammercock wreaks havoc in their ranks with its taste for tadpoles. On practically every stretch of water, a grey heron is waiting in ambush and making catch after catch. He has hardly swallowed one frog before he takes up position a little further on to catch another. Instead of eating its prey straight away, the heron seems to take pleasure in keeping it alive at the end of its beak. Indeed, if it dunks it several times in the water, it isn't to prolong its agony, it's to wash it. Before swallowing it, the heron must get rid of the poisonous substances that cover the frog. The savannah unfurls its beautiful green coat in all its splendor as far as the eye can see. Food is plentiful on this holy day, even if the full belly of some is at the cost of the death of a few others. These swallows drunk with the profusion of insects, are red-bellied swallows. There are about a hundred species of swallows. These that are about 20 centimeters long are among the biggest. Just like so many Christmas presents scattered here and there for the pleasure of their predators, the insects decorate the tall grasses, the flowers, the leaves, and the branches.
These tiny beings defend themselves as well as they can, sometimes adopting contradictory strategies. These caterpillars have spines and vivid colors to dissuade their aggressors. Another uses masquerade. It takes on the appearance of bird droppings so as not to attract attention. Which works perfectly on Birchall's Kukau, who goes off to look elsewhere. In the crash, the young impalas are slowly waking up. And like all babies, their first thought on waking is to find their mothers to suckle. But this one very quickly realizes that he only has his little friends around him and one or two female carers on guard duty. His mother is doubtless just a little way away, but he doesn't know where. It's surprising that she appears so unconcerned with such a small baby. In any case, she's in no hurry to feed him. So he tries his luck with one of the other duty females. A waste of time. Identification negative. He's not her baby, so he can't suckle. If the young impala wants to eat, he must find his own mother. In answer to his cries, the little gazelle hears only the bird song. First, the very distinctive one in two clear beats of the black-bellied Kohan. And then, the song of the Franklin, which is more like a shout than a song. As there are nearly 300 species of birds in the savannah, and they sing at the same time, or in turn, one has the impression that every one is singing his verse to celebrate Christmas. The truth is more prosaic. In fact, all these birds are looking for a partner. Among woodland kingfishers, when the pair have got together, it's impossible to tell the male from the female. On the other hand, it's easier with the lesser masked weaver when they're reproducing. The male is distinguished by its characteristic black mask. For all the weavers, Christmas time is a favorite time to prepare for newborns. This is when the males gather in dozens, if not hundreds, in the same tree to build their nests, despite the rivalry between them. Because with these birds, the female doesn't choose a partner. She chooses a nest, and it's the builder of the best nest who wins the right to mate with her. You can see why the males choose this time of year. It provides the birds with precious raw material, long stems of green grass whose flexibility is just right for weaving. The technique never changes and begins with the choice of a branch, always pointing towards the ground. The bird clears away the leaves roundabout and starts on the building of a hoop 
whose lower part will serve as a perch throughout the works. Those birds who finished building place themselves at the entrance to the nest and start to beat their wings furiously. This is a signal to females that there's a home to visit and an available partner. On this 25th of December, the savannah is full of animals who are going to have or who have just had their young. And that keeps them busy. The parents are by nature more or less attentive and vigilant, and the young more or less turbulent. The young of the spotted hyena don't go far from the burrow. They can play outside, but only if their mother is there. The mother is fairly tolerant of her two unruly children, who spend most of their time fighting. These two are brother and sister. When the young are not fighting, they are training. At least, they are exercising their jaws. By biting on wood from their very first days, their jaws will develop phenomenal strength. When they are adults, they will be able to break any bones, and those bones will make up a large part of their diet. It is thought that this is why the mothers have such long lactation. and their young reap the benefits. Whereas most canines are weaned at two or three months, hyenas can enjoy the mother's warmth for a long time. They are often still suckling at one year old. On this Christmas day, the menus are more or less unappetizing, and the feasts are often very lively. While the dung beetles are reveling, a blister beetle is quietly devouring flower petals. This large, brightly colored beetle has nothing to fear from birds or other possible predators. If attacked, it releases cantharidine from its joints. This is a poison which causes cells to burst. And the released dose is so strong that it leaves assailants with no chance. In any case, the go-away bird is not tempted. It only eats fruit. As it has to drink frequently, it spends Christmas by the water, along with the fish-eating birds, or those who should be. The woodland kingfisher, contrary to all expectations, is an insectivore. It's a kingfisher that doesn't fish. And if you see it diving into the water, it's just going about its ablutions.
It's a peaceful but slightly sad Christmas dinner for this she-lion who is eating all alone. One proof of the current abundance of food is that there's still a lot of meat left on this abandoned carcass. Unsurprisingly, some other guests have invited themselves, and they're already full up. The she-lion hasn't gorged herself. After devouring five or six kilos of protein, she too abandons the dead buffalo. The leopard keeps his distance. He thinks about coming down, but finally decides to stay in his tree and relax. After all, Christmas is a day of rest. And why bother to go hunting when the larders are full? This habit of dragging prey up into the trees is directly linked to the presence of the large predators. In regions where the leopard suffers no competition from lions, hyenas or wild dogs, he leaves his prey on the ground. In search of his mother, this young impala has moved away from the group. With no mother's milk, he is already quite interested in the taste of the leaves and grasses that will be his diet as an adult. He seems quite unconcerned. But with the impala, weaning only comes at four and a half months, and without milk, the little impala will die, even if by some miracle he avoids all the predators. In fact, the herd isn't far away, and among all those females, there is bound to be the one that gave birth to him less than a month ago. He must go back and join the others, not get discouraged, and accept yet more disappointments, more indifference. But it's Christmas, and the story has to end happily. So we'll finally see them meet again, and the baby will be happy. Even if he is getting less motherly love than good quantities of milk. Once again, it's just the master of the harem who has created the panic in the herd by chasing off a rival. Who can tell today whether in a year this handsome bachelor will have learned to use his horns well enough to take control of the herd? or whether these young ones will get through the year without mishap. But one thing is certain. The mimosa flowers will soon fade. Days and days will pass, and then Christmas time will come again, with all its newborn and its tender grass. <laughs>